All right, so, um, uh, so let's continue uh, looking at the, um, uh, the gravitational wave measurements with, uh, with Lisa. So yesterday we, we went through the, um, uh, the uh, calculation of the instrument response to a gravitational wave. Uh, and today, let's, uh, uh, let's finish uh, um, talking about the, this response. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the, the modeling of the noise response in the instrument. So, uh, so we looked at this, uh, this uh, plot of the, the sources uh, in, in LISA yesterday, where we have uh, supermassive black hole uh, binaries, uh, which are these, uh, these traces here. So the, the, the thing about these sources is that um, high mass systems will emit in the, in the lower uh, range of the, uh, of the frequency band. So um, all of these uh, uh, time delay interferometry effects that we saw yesterday, they're, uh, they're very important at high frequencies where, where the, the frequency of the wave is comparable to the, the inverse uh, light travel uh, distance uh, between, uh, uh, along the arm. Uh, but uh, at lower frequencies, we can make um, more approximations in order to, to get a simpler and uh, more familiar uh, response. Ah, went too far. So, um, uh, so let's derive the, the gravitational wave response uh, at low frequencies. So first, uh, the... Uh, uh, the signal due to gravitational waves in our single arm variables here, uh, y, i, j, k. Here I chose y, 2, 3, 1 as an example. Uh, these are uh, phase measurements. And the phase is um, uh, the, the, uh, the phase modulation due to the gravitational wave uh, is equal to the... Um, to the modulation of the arm length uh, divided by the um, uh, by the leading order term for the for the arm length the arm length uh, in the absence of gravitational waves so we derived this equation yesterday and in the long wavelength approximation well, what we can assume is that uh, this uh, metric perturbation which is a, a function of time, is constant um, uh, during uh, uh, one travel um, uh, of the beam along the arm. So in order to get an idea of uh, where this, uh, this approximation will be useful, a, uh, the light travel time uh, along an arm is about 8.3 seconds. So when your frequency is, is uh, much lower than uh, 0.1 hertz, you can hope the, that this approximation will be useful. So if this quantity is, uh, is a constant, then uh, uh, we can take it out of the integral, and the integral would just be delta u. And delta u is the, the difference in uh, retarded time uh, between the point of reception and uh, the point where the signal was sent. Uh, and this delta U, delta U will exactly cancel uh, this factor here, uh, 1 minus k hat, that's L3 hat, where L3 hat is the uh, direction of the arm, and k hat is the, the propagation wave, uh, vector of the, of the gravitational wave. So in the end, we just get the, uh, uh, the contraction between the, um, 
between the perturbation tensor, HAB of, uh, uh, at the uh, retarded time at reception with the, uh, uh, with the arm length. Okay, so um, now we can, we can take this result and plug it into, uh, into our uh, uh, single round trip uh, TDI variable, mx. So if you recall, uh, let me just uh, sketch this again. So if you have spacecraft one, spacecraft two, spacecraft three, this variable will be uh, equal to the difference between uh, the, the phase modulation in a signal that traveled at spacecraft two, bound stuff, measure as spacecraft one, and, uh, and a similar signal uh, traveling along the other arm. So, um, uh, so the, these factors here, uh, this will be just uh, a, AJB uh, L3 hat A, L3 hat B, uh, s since we're, uh, we're working uh, in the equilateral triangle approximation, uh, L3 prime will just be minus uh, L3. So L3 prime, L3 prime will be equal to L3, L3. And same thing between uh, L2 prime and L2. So we get this uh, gravitational wave response at low frequencies in uh, the single round trip variable. So if we, if we want to, uh, to, to simplify the, the response, uh, we can compute what the, the geometric, geometrical factors uh, present in the gravitational wave R, and uh, uh, and then use those to uh, uh, to compute our results. So just a, a sketch here. Uh, if I place myself in a frame with here x y z in a in a frame where. Uh, my triangle, my triangle is in the uh, x y plane, and I have a I have a source here that emits a, a gravitational wave uh, along this vector k. Uh, I can construct a uh, a triad uh, with k hat and two extra vectors. P hat and Q hat, uh, and uh, well, P and Q uh, as a function of the um, uh, of the position of the source uh, in the detector frame. So theta and phi will be the uh, spherical angles of the uh, source position in the detector frame. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use more, but thank you. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll be making uh, much more drawing. Um, all right. So the, the metric perturbation, uh, we can decompose it into uh, two polarization states, uh, the plus and cross polarization. So as these two functions, h, h plus of t and h cross of t, each multiplied by a, a polarization tensor, e plus and e cross. And as a function of, the, of um, our triad here, k, p, q, uh, these will define two uh, principal uh, polarization tensors, epsilon plus and epsilon cross. Uh, constructed like this. 
uh, and our wave will include a, uh, a, an extra uh, polarization phase factor, psi, which depends on the relative orientation of the, uh, of the orbit with respect to the sky position. Right, so we can, we can take uh, this expression. We have uh, epsilon plus uh, as a function of the sky position uh, angles, t theta and phi, e plus uh, as a function of the polarization phase. We can plug this in, um, we can plug this in here, and now all we have to do is to express our arm length vectors uh, in this frame where the, uh, where the detector is in the xy plane. So if we choose that uh, the, the bisector of the, uh, of the x and y, uh, of the x and y uh, plane uh, is, uh, is also a bisector of, uh, uh, of the constellation, of the triangle here, uh, we can consider then the the three uh, the three combina linear combinations of m x m y and m z like this. So we choose m y to be just m x, m two to be one over root three, m z minus m y, and m three equals one third uh, of the the sum m x plus m y plus m z. If we plug in the expression for the arm length um, L3 and L2 and L1, and we compute uh, the, uh, the gravitational wave response in those uh, combination of our single round trip variables, we get a very familiar result where age, uh, the, so the, the gravitational wave response in the combinations M1 and M2 uh, will be expressed as uh, a linear combination of the, uh, uh, of the polarization states H plus and H cross with antenna pattern functions F plus and F cross depending on our uh, geometrical angles. It takes, uh, it takes this form, so uh, this is the, the, the same exact form that we get uh, if we compute the response in a, uh, in a static, uh, in a static Michelson interferometer, yes? M1, M2, M3 are uh, those linear combinations of Mx, My, Mz. So, so we chose these li linear combinations because uh, in the end, uh, we, we obtained the antenna pattern functions uh, that uh, satisfy these two equations. So the, the cross polarizations uh, will be equal to the plus polarization at, uh, um, uh, with, an ang with a polarization angle uh, dif uh, different by uh, 45 degrees. And the, the, second, uh, the second variable, the, the antenna pattern functions of the second variable will be the same as the one for the first variable, but uh, rotated in the plane uh, by an angle of 45 degrees. Right, so what that means uh, is that in the low frequency approximation, Oh, and I should mention also that the gravitational wave response in M3 uh, is zero. So in the long wavelength approximation, LISA is equivalent to uh, two collocated Michelson interferometers rotated by 45 degrees with respect to each other. And we get an extra factor in the response square root three over two, 
which is due to the to the opening angle of the uh, of the Michelson interferometers here in the triangle, uh, which are sixty degrees. So um, let's not forget that the, our detector is moving. So so. Um, uh, all these uh, uh, these uh, f plus and f cross, uh, they are they depend on uh, angles that are computed in a frame tied to the detector. So as our detector moves, uh, these angles will change. So our uh, uh, our antenna pat pattern functions will depend on time uh, because of the motion of the detector. All right, yes? Yeah, 10 to the minus, yeah, you can go to 10 to the minus two with this approximation, yeah. approximately. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really, uh, yeah, let me go back to the, uh, to this plot. It's really when you start uh, when you start increasing, because uh, um, this approximation, if you look at the uh, uh, at the noise response, which we'll look at later, if you look at the noise response, you get um, you get very good agreement here, uh, and here you start uh, you start being flat in the long wavelength approximation. So as soon as you, as you get to this um, about 10 to the minus two, then you really need to take into account the, the, whole, uh, the whole time delay interferometry. All right. All right, so, so let's talk about the noise now. So the noise uh, in the detector uh, will be uh, dominated by uh, three different uh, noise components. The first, uh, a component that's independent in each single arm variable. It's dominated by the laser shot noise. So, excuse me. So what this means is that um, uh, as the uh, as the light signals are emitted here, and they they travel along the arm, uh, when they arrive uh, at the detector and they're observed, uh, you have lost uh, you have lost a lot of uh, of power in the laser, so you observe um, you observe very few photons compared to. Uh, uh, to the signal with which you're you're comparing with, uh, and this is the origin of the shot noise. Uh, you get a second component that's uh, uh, independent for um, in each of the three arms, and that's proportional to the displacement noise of the test masses. So these test masses will. Uh, will jitter about a little bit due to, uh, to, to various per perturbations, accumulated charges, uh, etc. And, uh, and the effect is that uh, as the light signal as the light signal is emitted, it's first it's bounced off this test mass, then it's sent to the other spacecraft. When it, other, it, when it arrives at the other spacecraft, it's bounced off uh, the test mass uh, in that spacecraft, and then, it is, uh, and then it's recorded. So if, if that test mass moves about uh, uh, due to, to random noise, then this will induce a random noise as well in the, uh, in the arm length, which is essentially what we're measuring. Uh, and the, the, um, the third noise component uh, is the, the laser phase noise. Uh, and it, it is the, the, the dominant component. And it, and it is the one that we're trying to reduce 
as much as possible by using time delay interferometry. So the, the model uh, in the noise that, uh, that we can use will be uh, in the, um, uh, the noise in, in the single arm variables uh, will have one component, which is uh, uh, just the, the shot noise, and which is independent in each measurement. Then you will have uh, one component uh, due to the uh, acceleration noise. That's due to the displacement of the test masses. Uh, and, it, and it's going to be the, um, uh, the projection of the uh, displacement of the two test masses um, that you bounce your signal uh, with uh, along the arm. Uh, along which the, the, the signal travels. And for the laser phase noise, uh, in, each, in, each of those, um, in each of those spacecrafts, you, you lock the, the phases uh, of the two lasers. So you, you, so you get one, uh, one component uh, in each spacecraft. Uh, and, and you... Uh, you compare uh, you you compare the phases of the signal uh, when you receive it um, with the the signal uh, when you uh, when you sent the when you sent it. So it's uh, so it's go going to be laser phase noise in the receiving in the receiving spacecraft at time t minus the laser phase noise in the sending spacecraft, I, with a time delay corresponding to the uh, travel along the arm. We can assume that each of these uh, noise components are Gaussian, uh, and they have a power spectral density, which are given by uh, these quantities. So this is the Fourier transform of a, a laser phase noise component, NLJ, uh, with a Fourier transform of NLK, uh, averaged over uh, all noise realizations. And if you compute this average, you will get a, uh, the power spectral density, uh, 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 Kronecker delta JK, which tells you that uh, the phase noise in each spacecraft is independent, uh, and a delta function for the frequencies, because you have uh, Gaussian noise. Same thing for the shot noise, with a different uh, power spectral density. And same thing with the uh, three, three spatial components of each of the uh, acceleration noise, the different uh, the different power spectral density. All right. So uh, if we want to compute the the, uh, the noise in each of the uh, uh, in each of the single round trip variables, m x, m y, m z, uh, we can express them as a function of the uh, single arm variables y i j k. So mx is given by this, uh, this equation. Uh, this, uh, if, you look, if we look at the shot noise first, uh, this uh, y231 will have the shot noise component n3. Uh, this y1 3 prime 2 will have shot noise component n3 prime with a time delay. Uh, and in the other arm, you get uh, the same thing with uh, N2 prime and N2. All right, so now to compute the power spectral density of the shot noise in Mx, you compute this integral of the, uh, of the average uh, of the noise in Mx times the noise in Mx conjugate. Uh, 
and this, uh, so you will get the average of uh, this combination of shot noises. And the thing is that uh, this N3 here will only, um, will only contrib contribute when it's combined with uh, the same N3 on the, uh, on the other sides of the multiplication sign. Same thing for the N3 prime, same thing for N2 prime, same thing for N N2. So what you get is uh, uh, four times, uh, four times uh, this with N3, N3, which will just give you uh, the PSD of the shot noise. So you get one fourth because of this uh, factor one half here. Uh, times four times the, uh, the shot noise. So the um, shot noise component in MX will be the same as in the, um, uh, in the single arm, uh, in the single arm variables. All right. Now we can look at the correlations between uh, MX and MY, uh, for example. So you uh, compute the same integral with my here. Uh, and you get this with for mx, and my uh, is the same with a cyclic, cyclic permutation of the indices. Uh, and the thing is that uh, this n3 here will um, combine with this n3 here n3 prime with n3 prime. n2 prime will not, uh, not combine with any of the noises uh, on the other sides. Same thing for n2, n1, n1 prime. So in the end, you only get two terms. Um, you get uh, this, uh, this combination with uh, this time delay here, it's n3, uh, N3 uh, star, and this combination with the, this time delay here. So in the end, if you compute, you get minus one half cosine two pi FL uh, times the shot noise. All right. For the acceleration noise, uh, we can uh, we can express them uh, like this. So same thing as before. We know what the acceleration noise in yijk is, and we and we can uh, we can express it in uh, uh, in mx as this combination. Now recall that uh, l three prime in our level of approximation is minus l three. Uh, L2 prime is minus L2. So if we group together uh, all the factors uh, in N3, uh, we get this term here. And all the factors in N2 prime will be this term here, and N3 prime and N2. All right. So. Uh, if we compute the, the power spectral density of the acceleration noise in MX, uh, we get that uh, uh, this N3, uh, this L3 factor uh, on the left hand side of the uh, multiplication will uh, combine with the same factor on the other side. So we, you will have one plus uh, two time delays. So in the Fourier domain, e to the four pi i f l, uh, multiplied by the same term, complex conjugate, uh, one with uh, one with l three, which will be given by this factor here, and one with l two, which is given by this factor here. You get two extra terms, which are given by uh, this factor here and this factor here. So in the end, you get the uh, PSD of the acceleration noise uh, times two cosine squared two pi FL plus two. Right. 
you can do the same thing with the uh, uh, noise correlation between mx and my. Finally, and um, uh, so here, uh, this N3 will combine with this N3 here. This N2 prime does a, doesn't appear there. This N3 prime will combine with this term, and N2 uh, doesn't combine with anything uh, either. So in the end, you'll get two terms, uh, this term times this term, which will be here. And, uh, and that term times uh, this term, which is here. Uh, so you get minus 1 half. Uh, this here is uh, a cosine 2 pi fl. Well, it's 2 cosine 2 pi fl. These are unit vectors, so their norm is 1. So in the end, we get this uh, correlation between the acceleration noise in mx and in my. Right. So um, that's all very good. We can, we can use that uh, for our uh, data analysis. However, it's, it's uh, much simpler uh, to use uncorrelated uh, noise channels to perform data analysis because you're well, you, you don't have to uh, worry about uh, uh, correlations. You can just add uh, signal-to-noise ratios in each of your components. Uh, so in order, to, in order to do that, we can look for a linear combination of mx, my, mz, in the Fourier domain uh, and try to find uh, uh, these a1, a2, a3 such that, um, su such that the, the noise is uncorrelated uh, with other, uh, other components. So the, the signal-to-noise ratio uh, in this combination eta is given by this integral. So it's the, um, the, square of the, um, the square of the gravitational wave response in the Fourier domain divided by the uh, power spectral density of the noise in eta integrated um, over the, the frequencies. Uh, since uh, our eta is a linear combination of mx, my, mz, we can express uh, this integral like that. So um, uh, the component in mx, component in my, component in mz times a noise correlation matrix uh, multiplied by the same uh, vector eta. And uh, the, um, because of the symmetries in our problem, the noise in mx, the noise in my, and the noise in mz will all be equal. And the correlations, uh, as we computed them, they will be all equal and real. So our, our matrix uh, has this form here. Uh, so if we want to, uh, to find uncorrelated noise channels, all we need to do is to diagonalize this matrix uh, and we will find, we'll find our, our answer there. All right, so this matrix has rank three. So, it, and so this means that we, uh, our mx, my, and z will give us three independent uh, channels over which we can perform our data analysis. So the, uh, the noise correlation matrix has uh, two eigenvalues. It has one two-dimensional eigenspace and one one-dimensional eigenspace. 
we can choose a basis of eigenvectors uh, for this matrix, uh, like so. Uh, so this means that uh, our uh, data channels that have uncorrelated noise with each other will be given, this vector will give us one over root two mz minus my, which is here, which we call uh, a, the am channel. And if we recall the, uh, um, the expression of our um, long wavelength approximation uh, channels, this will be uh, proportional to m2. EM will, given by, will be given by this combination of MX, MY, MZ. Uh, and this is proportional to M1 minus M3. Uh, and finally, TM uh, in, the, uh, in the other eigenspace will be proportional to M3. Since uh, AM and EM are part of the same eigenspace, they will have uh, the same power noise power spectral density. Uh, Tm will have a, a different noise power spectral density, however. Right, one other thing to, to mention. So uh, if we want to look at the um, at the gravitational wave res response in the uh, long wavelength approximation in those uh, uncorrelated data channels, we find that the, uh, the response in AM is proportional to the response in M2. The response in EM will be proportional to the response in M1 since the response in M3 vanishes and the response in TM just vanishes. So, in this sense, uh, the uh, long wavelength uh, approximation data channels that we just defined earlier uh, will correspond to uh, data channels with uncorrelated noise. So if you use those uh, long wavelength uh, approximation data channels, you can do your data analysis assuming that the noise is uncorrelated. Uh, in those variables. All right, so the, if we want to compute the power spectral densities in those data channels, uh, those will be given by the eigenvalues uh, of the noise correlation matrix. So the, the eigenvalues are uh, uh, in the AM and EM eigenspace. They're given by this factor. And if we plug in what we computed earlier for the uh, power spectral density of the noise in MX and the correlations, uh, we find this, this function of the frequency of the acceleration noise PSD and of the shot noise PSD. We can do the same thing in TM, and we find uh, this, this combination. All right? So if you, um, if you model your gravitational waves uh, with, the, uh, with the MX, uh, MY, MZ response function that we computed yesterday, uh, if you want to perform data analysis with them, uh, you, first, you first need to uh, uh, compute those combination of your responses. And then you can use those uh, power spectral densities of the noise uh, in your analysis. So uh, if we look at the contribution to the signal-to-noise ratio uh, for these uh, three data channels, AET, at low frequencies, we only have uh, A and E channels that contribute. And the T channel 
has uh, uh, has much much less uh, signal to noise ratio. But as we go higher and higher in frequencies, uh, the the three uh, data channels. Uh, Start to have a comparable signal to noise ratio. So if you if you do an analysis uh, at high frequencies uh, in this region, you really need to take the the three um, the three data channels into account. Okay. Yes. Yes. So 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 in order to compute this, so. Uh, this is for uh, monochromatic sources. So what I did here is that I computed the, the SNR uh, at each frequency uh, for a mono, monochromatic source uh, along a few years of, of observation with some amplitude. Uh, and this is what I plot here, the signal to noise ratio square divided by the uh, observation time and the amplitude square. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, more, more or less. So uh, uh, these. Uh, so, so the the noise power spectral density here, um, it has some, uh, uh, it has some structure, right? It, it, it depends on frequency, and it uh, uh, depends uh, on the frequency in an oscillatory manner. And uh, and this is what will impact the form of your um, uh, of your signal to noise ratio. So you also have to take into account that the response to gravitational waves also uh, has some oscillations in the response. And you combine them together, you find uh, these kinds of patterns. Um, so the the <coughs> sorry. So the main difference between those two, um, if I come back here, uh, the the T channel uh, will be more or less. Uh, a combination of uh, uh, this, uh, where you subtract, uh, where you subtract this, and you add this, and you subtract this, and you add this. Right. So, um, whereas. Whereas A, E, and T, they are really, they are really just uh, just the signal round trip Michelson uh, Michelson interferometers. So the uh, the way that this kind of pattern reacts in frequency will be will be different from from this one and. Uh, that's the, the origin of the, the difference that you get at high frequencies. Right. Um, right. I'm going extremely fast. So um, we found those uh, two combinations of MX, MY, MZ uh, in the low frequency limit. Uh, AM and EM, which have uh, non-vanishing gravitational wave response and uncorrelated noise. So uh, their response, uh, as I said earlier, is proportional uh, to the response in M2 and the response in M1. Uh, and if we want to uh, compute the noise power spectral density uh, in the M1 and M2 channels, we just uh, divide by this factor. Um, 
and, uh, uh, and the noise in M1 and M2 will be given by this. And since we're in the low frequency limit, we can take the low frequency limit of this, uh, uh, of this combination. This will just give one, and this will just give one. So you will have uh, 12 divided by three, which is four times the acceleration noise PSD, and here, three by three, just one times the, the shot noise. So you can, uh, if you want to work in the low frequency limit, you can use the responses with the antenna pattern functions that we computed earlier in M1 uh, and in M2, uh, and use this as the noise power spectral density. All right. Now, if you want to work with the uh, first generation uh, TDI variables, uh, the, the, the leading order term uh, in the shot noise and in the acceleration noise will be, uh, will be given by the, uh, uh, by the dominant term in the, uh, in the time delays. And the dominant term in the time delays uh, is just the equilateral triangle approximation. And is, in this approximation, we have this simple relation between x and mx. So in the Fourier domain, you get, uh, you get this relation between the Fourier transforms. Uh, so this will give just this factor for uh, sine to pi fl. So the noise in x will be uh, the modulus square of this prefactor times the noise in mx. So noise in x is 16 sine squared 2 pi fl uh, times the noise in mx. Since uh, this relation uh, is the same for y and for z uh, as a function of my and mz, uh, you will get the, the same relation for the, um, uh, for the other power spectral densities and for all the correlations. So you're uh, in these uh, x, y, and z uh, channels, the noise correlation matrix will have exactly the same form. So you can build uh, similar uncorrelated noise channels, A, E, and T, uh, with uh, power spectral densities will which will have the same, uh, the same prefactor. In the uh, second generation variables, the, we have the same relation between the second generation and the first generation variables, this time with uh, four time delays. So we find, um, hmm. yes. So we find a um, we find a similar uh, a similar relation between the noise in x one and the noise in x. So in this case as well, you can also uh, diagonalize your noise correlation matrix in the same way. Find your uncorrelated noise channels and work with that. All right. So uh, I mentioned yesterday that we, uh, we developed all this uh, time delay interferometry business in order to reduce the laser phase noise uh, in our var variables. Uh, and the question is, by how much? So um, in order to compute that, we can uh, look at those variables with uh, three different kinds of time delays. So we have the choice of, um, uh, choice of the time delay that we use in order to build our variables. Uh, we can use uh, 
we can assume that the arm lengths are equal and constant. We will get this combination for mx. If we, if we assume that the uh, arm lengths are, are different, but we ignore the spacecraft velocities, <coughs> sorry, we will get our uh, time delays uh, like this, which uh, uh, do not depend on time. And if we use the exact arm length, we have to use the uh, uh, non-commutative time delays uh, that we defined yesterday, like this. So uh, we have the freedom to choose the, time of, the type of time delay that, uh, that we use to construct uh, our TDI variables, but uh, the time delays that, uh, that occur in the single arm uh, variables y, i, j, k, those are uh, physical effects. So if we, if we want to estimate the effect of, uh, of those, we need to, uh, we need to use the, the exact time delays. So in, or, in order to compute, uh, to compute that if, uh, those effects, we will need to, um, uh, we will need to, uh, uh, to do the same thing as we did, uh, as we did earlier when we looked at the, uh, uh, the noise correlations and the, and the noise power spectral densities, but using, uh, using exact time delays. So we need to, uh, compute uh, what these exact time delays are in the Fourier domain. So first of all, we can recall that the, uh, the arm length at leading order are just a constant, plus some expansion in the orbital eccentricity and in the orbital velocities of the spacecraft. Uh, so we can write this as just L0 plus delta L j of t for each of the L j of t. Uh, and we can uh, look at this factor. So uh, this delta L uh, will be uh, very small uh, compared to uh, any frequencies that we're, uh, that we're interested in. So F delta L j will be small, it will be per periodic because the, uh, the, or the Keplerian orbits are periodic uh, around the sun. Uh, so we can uh, tailor expand uh, this uh, exponential here like that. Uh, and then we can, ta uh, we can decompose these delta Lj's in a Fourier series uh, with period with a period of a year. Uh, so this factor we can express as a sum uh, of uh, e to the 2 pi i p n t where n is 1 over a year. All right, so if we uh, compute the, the Fourier transform of our uh, of a delayed function h, uh, we can work like this. We can change variables, um, uh, find this. Uh, this factor L0 is just a constant, so we can take it out of this integral. We have this extra factor e to the 2 pi i f delta L which we uh, just um, tailor expanded and took the Fourier series, so we can take the same. So in the end, uh, these, um, these are uh, independent of time, so we can take them out of the integral. So we will uh, get a, uh, a sum of sidebands of the Fourier transform of age uh, separated by uh, multiple, uh, multiples of one over a year with some coefficients that we can compute uh, if, we know, uh, if we know what these, uh, uh, what these uh, expansion coefficients are. 
So we can do this, uh, uh, and then we can compute uh, the power spectral density of the laser phase noise in each of the variables. <coughs> uh, and here is what we find. So for the, uh, for the uh, um, single, uh, single round trip variables, mx, uh, my, mz, if, if we assume that the time delays are constant, uh, we get a laser phase noise uh, power spectral density like this, which has to be compared with the acceleration noise here and the shot noise here. So above 10 to the minus 4, above 10 to the minus 4 hertz, in a, in a real, uh, in real LISA measurements, we cannot use those uh, single round trip variables because we will be dominated by the, um, uh, by the laser phase noise. If we look at the uh, first generation variables, uh, as we uh, get better approximations, then the, uh, the laser phase noise reduces and reduces. So if you, assume, if you construct your TDI variables with constant arm length, uh, you're here. So uh, uh, you don't have any hope of, uh, of using these, um, you know, these variables here. But if you, uh, if you take into account the fact that the arm length are different, uh, you start reducing your laser phase noise. And if you take into account the uh, spacecraft velocities as well, you start getting so, some results that you can really use uh, in your measurements. So here, at say low frequencies, say below a few millihertz, you will be able to use your uh, first generation variables if you take the spacecraft velocities into account. And, the, uh, and finally, uh, this is why um, the second generation TDI variables will be important uh, to use in LISA measurements. And that's because uh, if you take into account uh, the different arm length and the spacecraft velocities, you reduce your uh, laser phase noise well below your, the acceleration noise and the shot noise uh, in your variables. Yes? So, so, um, so what you have, uh, what you, ha what you, the data that you get from your detector, is uh, these uh, y, i, j, k uh, variables, right? And you get, you get these functions as uh, uh, you, uh, these measurements as a function of time. So you you can construct your variables. Um, like this, you, you do these, uh, these time delay uh, combinations in post-processing. So uh, you get this, six of those functions, and you, if you combine those six functions, uh, uh, you can choose which kind of time delay you, you use, right? You can, you can take this function plus this function with a, just a constant time delay, and that will be one answer, right? If you take the different arm length into account, your, your time delays will be slightly different, so the, the mx will be slightly different. And if you use the exact arm length, you will get something uh, still a little bit different. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah. So so the so the thing is, uh, uh, if you uh, especially for the uh, especially for the second generation uh, TDI variables, uh, the the take home message is that if you don't use the exact arm length uh, in post processing to uh, compute your TDI variables uh, for the time delays, you will not be able to reduce the, the laser phase noise below uh, the shot noise and the acceleration noise. You really need to uh, take these uh, exact arm length into account in order to reduce your noise level uh, so that you can neglect it. All right. Yes, yes. Yes, it is our choice. Um, uh, but this, uh, uh, this plot tells you that the one of these choices is wise, uh, and the others are uh, not so. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I went much faster than anticipated. So uh, do you have any questions on uh, what we did so far on the Noise modeling. Nothing. All right. So um, let me now uh, uh, start de describing um, real uh, supermassive black hole binary measurements. So um, those are those are. Uh, different simulations. Uh, I will describe uh, different uh, simulations that have been done in order to uh, ass assess the, um, uh, the data analysis capabilities of the detector. So how well you can measure your masses, how well you can measure your spins, um, uh, and, different, and different effects. So first, let me uh, uh, describe the, uh, uh, the gravitational wave signals that we use. So the gravitational wave signals uh, will be, uh, uh, typically we divide it into three phases. First, uh, the spiral phase where um, the binary is well separated and we can uh, uh, we can use a post-Newtonian approximation to expand our uh, gravitational wave signals uh, in, uh, uh, in powers of the orbital velocity or a, a similar post-Newtonian parameter. Uh, so in this regime, the, uh, uh, the gravitational wave signal uh, in terms of the two polarizations, F plus and F cross, can be e expressed uh, e uh, can be um, expressed as a series of harmonics of the orbital phase. So your your orbital phase uh, evolves uh, like this, uh, and you will have um, you will have some contribution at uh, one times. Uh, the orbital phase, uh, another uh, two times, uh, etc. Uh, and in this case, uh, the, so the dominant uh, mode is the second harmonic, as I'm sure many of you are, are aware. Uh, so, um, right. So uh, these uh, gravitational waves will be affected uh, by the redshift. So the, the gravitational wave signals, uh, as they travel from far away into our detectors, uh, those will be redshifted. So if you 
compute your uh, post-Newtonian parameter here uh, in the source frame using the, uh, 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 the orbital frequency omega here of the source. Uh, you can also express it as a function of the uh, orbital frequency that you observe, uh, which will be redshifted like this, like that. If you rescale your masses uh, as a function of the redshift, and this is why we uh, uh, we only ever measure redshifted masses. We don't really measure. Uh, the intrinsic masses directly. Uh, another, uh, another factor is that uh, if we express now our wave amplitude as a function of the redshifted masses that we observe, you know, the, the distance measurement uh, that uh, uh, corresponds to our wave amplitude will be the luminosity distance. Uh, which is given by 1 plus z times the co-moving distance, which is what appears in the, uh, uh, in the, in the source frame. You will have uh, different effects that, uh, that modulate your waveform, one of which is uh, spin precession. So if you have uh, two spinning uh, compact objects, like two spinning black holes, along your orbit, and your spins are misaligned with the orbital angular momentum, this will result in the precession of the spins and the precession of the uh, orbital plane. Uh, and this precession of the orbital plane in particular, uh, this will uh, induce uh, a change in the, uh, in the orbital in inclination that has a direct effect in the, uh, on the amplitudes of the gravitational wave and also on the polarization phase. So these will uh, induce a, a, a very important uh, modulation of your signal uh, and in a, in a gravitational wave measurement, this will, um, this will help to uh, uh, reduce correlations between uh, different parameters that, we, uh, that you measure. So this will uh, improve your measurements on, on certain parameters. Your orbits can be, uh, can be eccentric. Uh, so, uh, Binaries on eccentric orbits, they will experience periastron precession. And what periastron precession does is it includes another uh, time scale into your problem. Uh, and the thing is, you will, your signal uh, will depend on two different close but different frequencies. It will depend on the, the periastron to periastron frequency and on the orbital frequency. And as the, sorry, yeah? Yes. Yes. For example, yes, yes. Yes, because your, your, your inclination is modulated by spins precession, your distance is not. So, um, hmm? yes, yes, it's an overall factor. But uh, uh, in the, uh, at leading order for your amplitudes, the, the, um, uh, they depend uh, mostly on uh, some function of the inclination and the uh, and the distance, and that's the only uh, that's the only place where the inclination and the distance appear uh, in your wave. So, um, uh, so those two parameters will be highly correlated. 
But if your uh, if your uh, system precesses, if your orbital plane precesses, then the inclination becomes a function of time. So your your amplitude becomes a function of time. So um, uh, so this modulation can help you uh, disen disentangle the variable part, which will be the inclination, with the, the distance, which is which stays a constant. Uh, during your whole measurement. Okay? Okay, yes. So you will keep calculating the dynamics between the Newtonian dynamics. This doesn't have very high. Yes. Would you still get harmonic from the frequencies if there is excess? Mm. Well, you. you so yes, yes, you yes you would still get um, you would still get harmonics of the uh, of the orbital phase due to the eccentricity, but your harmonics will not split uh, as in the, as in the relativistic case. And in this case, then because the time scale is different. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. So your 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 um, your wave essentially uh, gets a white chalk. So in the in the eccentric case, uh, your wave uh, h plus cross essentially is a sum uh, p q. A plus cross P Q of um, uh, of two different um, uh, yeah. of two different phases, say uh, P L and Q lambda, where uh, L will be the uh, the mean motion, which is the mean a periastron to periastron uh, phase, and lambda will be your your main uh, uh, your mean orbital phase. So the uh, along the orbit. So the uh, the frequencies associated with with these two phases will be slightly different. Um, so they will uh, you will get a splitting of your your harmonics. P and Q, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're harmonic numbers. Uh, harmonic numbers for the two phases. Oh, yeah, L and lambda, the phases. Yeah, and lambda the phases. Yeah. Yes? The orbital precession? Yes. Yes. Right. So, so this effect, um, this effect is quite small when you're uh, uh, very well separated, at uh, uh, say. Uh, Thousand or hundred uh, gravitational radii. This this is still a small effect, but it becomes more and more important as you uh, as you spiral in. So the the closer you get, the the uh, the more um, the more important the the precession will become. Right. So, uh, so another phase of the uh, uh, of the gravitational wave, um, uh, gravitational waves that we, we have, is the ring down. Uh, so after a merger, uh, you have your two black holes have just merged, and they form 
uh, and they form a remnant black hole that's highly distorted. And that's not anywhere close to a, to a Kerr black hole, which is your static solution. Uh, and what's, what it does is, uh, what that system does is that it quickly radiates away these extra degrees of freedom in order to, uh, uh, to arrive at the, the static solution, the final state that will be a Kerr black hole. Uh, and the, this radiation uh, is described in a, a series of damped uh, harmonics uh, that are each characterized by uh, some frequency, omega, and some uh, damping time scale, uh, tau. Uh, typically, we, we describe them using uh, three indices, L, M, N, where L, M, N, uh, L and M are the usual um, uh, spherical harmonics uh, indices. And N is, a, is an extra index that, uh, that comes into play because perturbations of a Kerr black hole um, with uh, 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 pure frequencies, the, the um, uh, the, the, the spatial, um, uh, the spatial dependence uh, uh, on, the, on the angles around the black hole are, are not exactly spherical harmonics, but are uh, slightly different functions that we call spheroidal harmonics, and they take an extra index. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So, so yes. In the limiting case, you can uh, you can in principle form a Schwarzschild uh, black hole uh, through a merger, but you really have to fine tune your spins. If you want to do that, yes, yes. That also there's also the extra factors, uh, but in in principle, uh, I mean, if you have spins that are not exactly like that, but a bit like that, you can in principle cancel out the orbital angular momentum. But yeah, it's very very high level of fine tuning. Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's a good place to stop here. Uh, so, in the rest of the lecture tomorrow, uh, I will talk about some studies that uh, estimated uh, the the measurement capabilities of Lisa. Uh, and some other uh, studies that are more um, inspired by fundamental physics, so uh, with uh, uh, extra, uh, extra bosonic fields, for example, can be uh, measured with supermassive black holes, or uh, you can test uh, if, you, uh, if you measure uh, several of these modes at the same time, you can test whether your remnant is a Kerr black hole or not. Uh, yes? So, so if you assume a standard binary black hole is 10 to the 6 or so, what yes. fraction of the total SNR is in the, in the ring down part? Um, a lot. I mean, um, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of the, of the SNR is in the ring down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, but it, it turns out that uh, uh, it turns out that most of the SNR uh, is emitted is emitted during the merger and the ring down. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
Uh, m most of them, yeah, 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 all of them, yeah. I mean, uh, if you're really, um, I mean, yeah. Let me go back to yeah. the to the beginning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So here, uh, where, uh, when your merger uh, starts to get in this regime, where the uh, uh, where the noise starts increasing with frequency, then you will accumulate more SNR in the in spiral. Okay. But uh, if your merger happens, uh, yeah, if your merger happens here, then. Uh, Yeah, you see that in the last hour you, you accumulate more SNR than uh, all the way before. I mean, you can still detect you can still detect your uh, your uh, um, your black hole um, like an hour or a day before merger, but um, uh, but most of your signal comes afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can also see it here, right? And here you're dominated by the merger, and as you go further back there, you're more and more dominated by the inspiral. No, no, they change. They change uh, very, very wildly at the uh, in the very last stages uh, uh, during the the plunge. Uh. Yes, to an extent, uh, because this in the, this happens um, this happens quite quickly. So, um, so during the last stages of the in spiral, that's when your um, that's when your spins uh, vary the the most rapidly. Uh, but as you're as you're uh, starting to really fall in, uh, then it just happens so quickly that um, uh, the, that you don't. Uh, you don't process that much anymore. Right. So uh, yes, um, it depends. So so it, it depends if there is an efficient mechanism to align the, to align the spins or not. Um, but um, but if uh, if you're if your mecha if your mechanism still aligns the spin but not exactly and you and you have say a, a, a remaining misalignment of ten degrees or so, then this will uh, be really helpful for uh, for data analysis um, hmm? Yes. Yes. Having uh, having misalignment really helps uh, data analysis. I mean, it, it it makes data analysis more difficult because the 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 signal is more complicated. But the results that you get are much better. Yeah. Very, uh, very good question. Yes, 
yes, we do expect, uh, uh, we do expect um, systems like that. We expect, uh, depending on the astrophysics, uh, but we, we expect uh, triple systems, for example, or, uh, like hierarchical triples where you have a, a hard binary in the center and a, and a third black hole uh, rotate, rotating around. And this will have uh, very interesting uh, uh, signatures um, in the data. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, you will probably lose a fraction of your SNR uh, because of that, uh, but I think you you still you will still be able to to recover your signal because uh, um, in a hierarchical triple like that the. Uh, uh, the outer binary is much uh, much more separated than the, uh, than the inner binary. So its effect, uh, the effect of the third black hole on the space space time that drives the the merger is uh, still small in some in some extent. Okay, thank you.